Welcome to In Edina, a program about the people, places, and activities all from the city of Edina. I'm your host, Lily McDonald, and it's tax time. And we're going to help you get prepared with this program. And joining us to kick off this discussion is Kevin Kala. You're a tax preparer. What a perfect person to have on the broadcast from Abdo Ike and Myers right here in Edina. That's right. We really pre Are you stressed? You know what? Uh, it's... <laughs> A little bit. It, it really all depends. Um, I, I guess the big thing is going through and getting it prepared early. I, you know what? I get stressed around tax time, and I bet a lot of folks uh, are like me. And it, I think it's because we have to have it all done by April 15th, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure what papers to get ready. What should I get ready? Well, the, the, the big key for you is you should really go through and assess your, your situation. A lot of people, um, they should go look through to see if maybe they want to look to do their returns themselves or if they should hire a, a preparer to assist them with it. Um, mm -hmm. For those, the ones who have like uh, W-2s and maybe are claiming a standard deduction or have a, a simple itemized deductions, um, they should feel free to go through and, and use a program maybe that'll help them calculate their taxes. There's good programs out there such as TurboTax. Soft software. Software, yeah. that's right. Um, but the software is only as good as the input. And a lot of times you'll see that if you're working with a, with a tax preparer, more times than not, they can find additional de deductions for you or credits that you're entitled to, and you're going to have so much more tax savings than the fees that you're going to generate. Yeah. So, really, when you're when you, some decisions you have to make. Number one, should I prepare my taxes by myself or not? Are they too complicated? Or you know, you file every year. Maybe this year you get some help, and next year you file yourself. But you, the important thing is, is if you're going to file them yourself, get some software to give you a guide. That's right. But if you got some special write-offs. Uh, get some help. Now, That's, what do we look for in help? Who, you know, what, you know, how do we know if a tax preparer such as yourself is any good? There's a Minnesota Society of CPAs, and they know all the different uh, um, firms, the tax preparers in this area, and they can go through and guide you to a preparer that's qualified in your specific situation. So they're a good place to start. Contact them and then ask them if they have anybody that works in your specific situation that can help you. The other thing is talk to a trusted advisor. If you work with a financial planner, if you have an insurance agent, if you have a banker, somebody that you trust, go through and ask them somebody they can recommend. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times they have a vested interest in sending you a referral that's going to do a, a competent job. So those are things to consider. But any anytime you're working with a tax preparer, I'm starting to work with it. Ask, ask them questions. There's going to be a number of questions that you should ask like, them. Like what? Well, you should ask them first. Um, you know how long they've been preparing returns. Um, how long they've been in the business? Do they do it year-round? Um, I, I would go through and also ask them, you know, how they how they assess their fees. You know, if you have any preparer who, who goes through and says, you know, our fees are going to be contingent on how much of a refund you get back. If it's based on a percentage, run, don't walk away from them. Mm -hmm. And if they promise you big refunds, um, be skeptical, um, because. Usually, whether you're entitled to a refund or not is really going to be based on your tax situation. I was going to say, you don't really want a <laughs> refund, really? Well, <laughs> well you want one, but... <laughs> but if your wages went up and your withholdings went right, down, right. there's a good chance you're not going to be entitled to those right. refunds. If they promise you large refunds, be skeptical. Um, why does the length of time matter? The How long time? they've been in business? Well... Uh, you want somebody with that experience, <laughs> you obviously, do, you but do. there's a lot to learn every single year, right? That's right. There's constant changes. And, and that's why it makes sense to, to maybe work with somebody who is aware of the constant changes with it. There's a lot of new credits out. There's new deductions. So there's a lot of new changes each year. And if you work with somebody who's seasoned, who has, who's experienced, they can help you, you know, walk through and make sure that your return's prepared accurately and for the least I mean, you're paying the least amount of taxes. Mm -hmm. Kevin, we should also mention, too, that we're not just talking about individual tax returns. Small yeah. businesses have to file tax returns as well. That's right. Advice for those folks. Well, their deadline's a little bit sooner. Their deadline is on March 15. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a lot of them, if they don't have their information in, they have the ability to go through and do a six-month extension. 
And that six month will buy them time to go through and gather their information so that they can do a, an accurate and complete return. Mm -hmm. If you get an extension, does that wave a flag to the IRS? Uh-oh. <laughs> does it? No, it really doesn't. The things that wave a flag to the IRS is if you go through and your deductions are so much more out of the normal. If you have travel expense or meals that are you know, twice or three times the industry average, those are gonna be red flags. So the IRS is not only comparing your tax return year to year That's right. to see what kind of changes you've had, but it's also comparing other people like you and it's or businesses like yours to see if you're all in the in the scope, right? That's right. They have certain matching processes. Mm -hmm. You know, every time 1099 you receive, every W-2 they receive, um, they're going to go through and match it, make sure it shows up on your return. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, you're going to receive a notice on it. Now, what if I miss something this year, and or last year? Yeah. Can I can I go back and catch up, or if I owe, do I want to draw attention <laughs> to that or not? What do you advise there? Well, there's a there's a three year statute of limitation. Okay. So it allows you to go back three years. If you're entitled to a refund, you missed a deduction, you can go back, prepare an amended return, and get that money back. Mm -hmm. um, even if you go through and you have a balance, you missed a you missed a, a an income source. It makes sense to go back because the IRS is going to have that information, and there's a good chance that they're going to find it later on down the road and your penalties and your interest will have accrued so much more. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you find those errors, I would look to go back and amend it. Great. Kevin, I feel more comfortable now that we've had this conversation. Thank you very much, Kevin, for your time, your expertise, and joining us on In a Dine It today. Thank you. There's something wild on your tax form, and it's an opportunity to help non-game wildlife in Minnesota. Carol Henderson from the Department of Natural Resources heads up the non-game wildlife checkoff program, and he's here to talk about it. Welcome to Inadina. Thank you very much. And happy tax time. Yes, it's that time of year again. What does the checkoff do? The checkoff provides direct funding for helping all of the kinds of wildlife in Minnesota that we don't traditionally hunt. Everything from bluebirds and bald eagles to trumpeter swans and backyard wildlife. And it's a program that's been around for quite a while. Yes, it started in 1977 and since 1980 it has been funded by donations people make at tax time on their Minnesota income tax In fact, tax it's, the, it's the only revenue raiser in the state of Minnesota uh, for donations. For yes, we're the program. only state program that's funded by donations. So how much goes to this program when I check off the box on my taxes? Uh, we get 100% of the donation goes to the program, and we get about $1.1 $1 .1 million per year. Okay. And do, do I write off all of, uh, if I get a return, do I write it all off or a portion? or do, You do can I write, write off whatever in? you wish. The average donation runs about $15 to $16, and it's tax deductible. And people can donate whether they get a refund or whether they owe money to the state. Okay. And so about a $1 million dollars from uh, the checkoff on right. the tax form. And then you, you do some matching funds too. Yes, th that donation is very important because then we can match that against revenue from the conservation license plates, the loon plates, mm -hmm. uh, and also from a state uh, wildlife grant money that's made available from the federal government. So that about doubles our budget up to just over $2 million per year. So we need your checkoff because we need the match money to fund about $2 million in programs in the state of Minnesota. What kind of, of, of non-game programs are funded? We have programs that range all the way from doing wildlife surveys to habitat restoration. We do educational programs in schools to help teach young people about the importance of wildlife around us. Um, and we also uh, help provide conservation efforts that uh, protect loons and other wildlife from uh, disturbance or contamination in the environment, uh, like promoting the use of uh, non-toxic fishing tackle. And also you, you do some research as well with some of this funding, right? Yes, we do research on wildlife populations where we need to do more about their status or how we can improve our habitat management for uh, various species. For species and so that they don't become extinct. Right. And you've got lots of success stories. Oh, we've got some wonderful success stories. We worked with a number of other conservation groups for restoration of uh, eastern bluebirds, for peregrine falcons, for trumpeter swans. We're now up over 3,000 trumpeter swans in the state. Uh, we did a program to uh, reintroduce river otters on the Minnesota River, and they're now doing very well. Uh, and all of these success stories go back to that little donation people make at tax time. And that's a big deal. Uh, you know, we're not just talking about the environment, what we see and what we what surrounds us, but these are these are satisfying educational programs as well. Oh yes, uh, 
the educational aspect is really important because we need to be helping coach those young people around us about how important the environment is so that when they grow up, they will find this uh, an important part of Minnesota's uh, environment as well. Now, what I think is interesting, too, is, is, is you're not just satisfying um, wide open spaces in Minnesota environmentally, but you're also working with residents in their own backyard and also the lakeshore property. Yes, one of our important aspects of promoting conservation is to show lakeshore owners what they can do to help promote water quality and sustainability on their own lakeshore by using native plants to do plantings on the shoreline, reduce the amount of maintenance they need to do on their lawn, and uh, bring back the butterflies and wildlife that uh, may have been lost when they originally planted grass all the way to the water's edge. Yeah, it used to be where you want to clear it all out, put in a sandy beach, but that takes away again from the environment. Right, so we did a book called Lakescaping for Wildlife and Water Quality that helps provide the guidelines to help do lakeshore restoration. Actually, Carrie, you're author of several books for the Department of Natural Resources as well, for, for backyard birding, for lakeshore property, what else? Uh, I did several different books. One is called Woodworking for Wildlife, one is Landscaping for Wildlife, one is called Wild About Birds, the DNR Bird Feeding Guide, and then we have another one, the Traveler's Guide to Wildlife in Minnesota, and then the other one, uh, I was a co-author on the Lakescaping for Wildlife and Water Quality. And all of these are available from most booksellers and from Minnesota's bookstore in St. Paul. And that's because so many of us have questions about what's growing and what's going on in the backyard environmentally. And it all gets started with that simple little checkoff right. on that tax form. All of these things are possible because of those donations. That's fabulous. Well, thank you very much, Carol, for all the work you do. You can tell you love your job. I sure do. And I'm sure all the animals out there love it, too. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us on In Edina. Thank you. Carol Henderson has devoted more than 30 years of his career to non-game programs in Minnesota. The wildlife restoration projects are many, but we take a moment and focus on trumpeter swans with Denny Baer, photojournalist from the Department of Natural Resources. This is the sound of success. The majestic trumpeter swan has made an incredible comeback in Minnesota. Once a native to our state, they were hunted for their meat, feathers, and skins. By the 1880s, there were none left to be found here. More than 90 years later, a man with a vision would help change that. When I first came in as the new non-game wildlife program supervisor in 1977, restoring trumpeter swans was one of my dreams, one of my goals. Enter the DNR's Carol Henderson and the non-game checkoff a DNR program designed to use donations from the public to benefit non-game species. By the middle 1980s, we had put together a plan. I went up to Alaska for three years in a row to collect 50 eggs each year to bring them back, hatch them, and then start releasing them into Minnesota. I was feeding ducks and geese along the river when we first moved here, and then swans started showing up. That's Sheila Lawrence, also known as the Swan Lady. Near her home in Monticello on this bitterly cold morning, hundreds of trumpeter swans glide among the mists of the Mississippi River. During the winter, Sheila's out there like clockwork feeding the swans, hauling two buckets of corn at a time, 1,500 pounds a day, seven days a week, even when it's too below with a minus 16 wind chill. They gobble down the kernels as fast as she can fill the plastic tubs, a moving canvas of bright white necks and black beaks. Since 1987, the DNR has released more than 350 trumpeter swans. Now about 2,000 of them call Minnesota home. More than half the flock shows up today for lunch. Inside the warmth of her dining room, Sheila uses binoculars to scan the swans for markings. She adds the information to her daily log. She's maintained incredible detailed records of all of the banded birds and the marked birds over the years, so we know how long they live, we know how many young they've had. Uh, so she's kind of our unofficial biologist there. Does that unofficial biologist ever get tired of the racket? I have a very faithful donor, and she said, you know, it's music to my ears, man. It's music to my ears, too. The birds are back. 
they're doing well. Without the checkoff, it would still be a dream. Two projects the non-game wildlife programs are focusing on this year are the Loon Survey and the Colonial Waterbird Survey. Remember, your donations are tax deductible. If you make a donation, you can write some of that off on your taxes. One organization that takes your donations and turns them around to help others in the community is Goodwill Easter Seals. And joining us to talk about their programs, Julie Fielman, Marketing and Communications Generalist. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you for your work with Goodwill. Nonprofit organization, yes. been around for a long time. Yes. What exactly does Goodwill do? Um, well, we've actually been around in Minnesota since 1919, and we work directly with the community in helping people who have barriers or disabilities, um, difficulties in finding jobs. Um, so we work directly with people in the Twin Cities area, and we help them uh, by giving them valuable job skills. And then we also help them by coaching them throughout the job search process and interviewing process. So resume writing, yes. interviewing, you know, and in this day and age, that is a lot of help. Yes. And one thing that's important too is um, not all nonprofit organizations like yours takes the profits that they, they receive and turns it back into the community. That's important to note, right? Right, absolutely. When you're considering donating your um, used items to a nonprofit organization, I think that you should feel uh, strongly about what that organization does in your community. Right, so yeah. Goodwill gives back by uh, helping people get back into to work. What kinds of items does Goodwill take? Uh, we take clothing for all ages, everything from kids to adults, and then um, small house housewares and toys and electronics. Sure. Um, yeah, so some take, furniture as well. Yes, yep, we also take large items. And when you get those items and people have to drop them off, you don't offer a pickup service, but there is help when you are dropping them off yep. to help you through that. But when you get those items, then what do you check for? You need gently used items, obviously. You want to, you don't want to give away junk, right? But you want gently used items, and then what do you do? You process them and price them, right? Yep, what we usually recommend to people is that they give items that they would only consider giving to their best friends. So think about the overall condition of the items. Would somebody be able to use that um, when you donate it? And, um, and the other thing, too, is, is, is that anybody shops at a Goodwill store. Yes. So the good news is, is that once the items are sold, you take that cash and then you create the, the training programs out of it, correct? Yes. Okay. Yep. Now the other thing that I didn't know Goodwill does, but it seems like more of these nonprofit organizations are doing this, and that is you're taking cars. Yes. You're taking cars and you mm -hmm. actually resell them once a week? How does yes. that work? Um, yep, every week we have a silent auction on Thursday mornings, and it actually takes place in our Goodwill Easter Seals uh, parking lot on Fairview in St. Paul, and people can donate their used vehicles anytime, and actually we have a 24-hour pickup service. Anybody can come and uh, put a bid in on any vehicle, and then the sale of those vehicles goes towards our programs as well. Do you find out the same day if you get the car? Yes. Okay. You do, actually. Right. Does the car have to be in running working order or, or, or not? Um, no, not necessarily. In fact, a lot of people that purchase our cars are people who enjoy working on cars. Um, so that isn't even uh, necessary that it's a running vehicle. So the point is, is that you can donate cars to Goodwill and the proceeds from those sales goes back into your programs and you can do that any time of the year? Yes. Okay, because the auction <laughs> is, is once a week. Right? Yep. Um, Julie, where, where can we find out more information about Goodwill programs and services and locations on where we might be able to donate? Sure. Um, our website is full of information about all of our different programs as well as information about all, all of our stores in the Twin Cities. And our website address is GoodwillEasterSeals.org. Wonderful. So if you've got something to give away, please do give it to Goodwill. And any of the organizations will be glad to take your donation. And don't forget, it's a tax write-off. Thanks for joining us on In a Dining, Julie. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, come tax time, it's also time to think about paying our property taxes and special assessments that all help pay for new streets or renovation of our streets in the city of Edina. Joining us to talk about just that, our city manager, Gordon Hughes, and also the director of Public Works, Wayne Hu. Welcome to In Edina. 
Thanks, Lillian. Nice Thank to you. have you yeah. gentlemen back again, as always. Always lots of projects going on, and property taxes and special assessments pay for that. Um, first, let's overview. What are special assessments? Well, special assessments are, uh, are really in addition to a normal property tax bill. Uh, they're allowed under state statute, and uh, they're there to pay for certain public improvements that benefit properties, streets, uh, utilities, uh, street lights, those sorts of improvements uh, are all eligible to be funded by special assessments. Mm -hmm. Pay twice a year through our property taxes, right? Well, most people do. Uh, when a special assessment is levied, a homeowner has the option of paying it all up front if they wish and avoid interest charges. Uh, but many elect to have them certified for collection with property taxes, typically over a 10-year period. And in Edina, these special assessments and property taxes pay for lots of street projects. Wayne, what's on the uh, agenda? Well, we, we have about 250 miles of streets in the city, and we reconstruct around five miles of neighborhood streets every year. So this coming year, um, we're planning to uh, reconstruct the Braemar Hills neighborhood, uh, one of the additions in the Parkwood Knowles neighborhood, the Pamela Park uh, neighborhood which will all be covered under special assessments. All right, let's break those down just a little bit. Um, starting with the Braemar area, what's gonna actually get done? What we do and when we look at a, a neighborhood, first, first we prioritize all the neighborhoods in the city as far as the years that they're gonna be reconstructed. We look at the pavements uh, to see how much the pavements have deteriorated, um, what to level of reconstruction we need to do on the pavements. And, and then we also look at the utilities and, and uh, we videotape the sanitary sewers. We look at the water main systems to see if we need to upgrade either one of those systems. And we fold all those together and that, that, that's how we prioritize the, the different neighborhoods. Now, and there's tons of projects around here with 250 miles throughout the city of Edina. You have to take them one at a time. You've got them planned out over several years. Braemar is scheduled for this summer, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, so the Braemar Hills neighborhood, what we're looking at is, is just essentially reconstructing the, the roadway bed itself, replacing the, the lighting system, okay. upgrading the lighting system. Okay. Um, so it should be a pretty straightforward project. Now the, uh, the Parkwood Knowles neighborhood, that's a, a, a little different project where we're reconstructing the roadways, but then we're also adding curb and gutter um, to, to the roadways. When you talk about special assessments, the, uh, um, the city actually picks up a, probably around 50% of a typical project through the utility funds when we're upgrading the utilities and then the stormwater fund pays for the uh, uh, curb and gutter replacement or upgrades. Okay, and it's not just paid for then through special assessments then, right, right? Well, that's right. Uh, as Wayne said, it's typically uh, about a 50-50 deal okay. with the city through its utility funds picking up all the costs of upgrading water mains, sanitary sewer, and storm sewer. And then, uh, since about five years ago, the city is also paying the cost of concrete curb and gutter. About 20% of the city was built without concrete curb and gutter. And in our view, it's very important to add that feature. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that reason, the council elected to, to pay for that cost. So the, uh, the portion that's uh, assessed is really just the street surface itself. Uh, and then to the extent neighborhoods would like things like upgraded street lighting, mm -hmm. sidewalks, other amenities, those typically are paid for through special assessments. Gordon, so. there's lots of different ways we can pay for these projects, but why does right. the city use special assessments? Well, this is something the council spent a lot of time on uh, a few years ago. The option available uh, to cities is really to either pay for these things through special assessments or increase taxes, uh, property taxes to pay for them. Some cities have elected to do it that way. Uh, in our case, the council elected to fund it principally through special assessments. Uh, you know, the reason uh, for that is really one of, of predictability and fairness. Uh, first, from a fairness standpoint, um, <clears throat> it's important that, that we try to spread that burden of street reconstruction as fairly as we can. Uh, some of our residents live in rather new homes where the, the price of the road and utilities was already factored into the purchase price of the house. Um, if we were to charge them taxes to pay for street reconstructions in other parts of the city, they in essence have paid twice uh, within a fairly okay. short period of time. The other thing is predictability. Uh, in Minnesota, uh, uh, property taxes and our ability to levy taxes is not a very predictable thing. Uh, every year the legislature seems to put different right. sorts of restrictions. Cities that have funded this solely out of property taxes have found that their revenues have decreased such that they've had to suspend and postpone street improvement projects 
have those streets meanwhile deteriorate even further and mm -hmm. become more costly to repair in the future. Mm -hmm. So our view is special assessment provides the means for us to keep up with those infrastructure improvements and not in essence be uh, held hostage and by property how taxes. How often do we uh, check our special assessments to keep them in, up to date? Well, the special assessments are really levied based on the actual cost of the project. So uh, a, a neighborhood that's comprised of very large lots uh, will probably pay more per lot okay. than a neighborhood of very small lots. Uh, but it, again, it's a way to try to spread the burden as, as equitably as possible given the, given the circumstances of, of each particular neighborhood. Well, when we're paying our property taxes and special assessments, we'll know what they're going for with our projects this summer and for the years to come. Gentlemen, thank you so much for Thanks, joining us on In a Dino. Thank you. We hope this program will help get you ready for tax time and put everything together for Uncle Sam. We'd like to thank all of our guests for their time and expertise and to you for watching. Also thanks to Brownstones on France for letting us bring you this program from their beautiful model home. You've been watching In Edina. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald. Until next time, make it a great day.